called The Church Defined, and we looked at how Christ is the head of the church, and we as believers are the body of the, the church. We are the, the head and the body make up the living organism, and without the body being attached to the head, then the church does not exist. And so we're going to continue that series today, but I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, that's going to be our text today, and while you're turning there, uh, uh, just you know, think about what it means to be in the local church, to be in the church of Jesus Christ. And how, how did you live out this past week as the body of Christ? And how did you live out being the hands and feet of, of the body of Christ? Today we're going to look a little bit different on that, but we're going to add to that a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, Fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Dusty, I'm ringing a bit up here. What then is Apollos, what is Paul, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each? Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Continues in verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work has anything built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in his age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thankful that we get the opportunity to worship you today, Lord. And we're thankful that we get to be part of your church, to be part of your body. And today, as we look closer at what it means to be led in this church, to be... um, part of a growing church, to be part of something that sustains, I pray that you would speak to us through this text, speak to us through this word that you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. So 
there's two hot tickets that are going on this summer. Uh, the first one, some of you might have actually gone. I'm not sure. Uh, I try and follow on Facebook to see who goes to these things, and I don't remember. Um, but there's two really, really hot tickets this, this summer. The first one is the Taylor Swift, is it Eras? Am I right on that? The Taylor Swift Eras concert tour, which she just added um, more dates because so many people want to go to it. And the other one is uh, tonight in, in Frisco, Texas. Uh Messi, if anybody follows soccer, Messi is like the great, the goat of all time, the greatest of all time soccer player, um, and he has just moved to the United States, and he is playing his first game in the Dallas area, and so these tickets are are really, really hot. They're so hot that um, some people have paid as much as thirty five thousand dollars to go see Taylor Swift this summer. And I have no doubt that it's a great concert, but $35,000 for um, a concert ticket. And ticket prices for tonight for the soccer game, for a 90-minute a soccer game, they are uh, on average of thirteen dollars to $1,500, with people paying as much as $20,000 just to be in the stadium tonight. It's crazy. I'm like, what do these people do for a living that, that they can do that? But we, the reason they do that is because we are a culture that loves celebrity, right? We are a culture that loves celebrity, and, and we don't want to miss an opportunity to see that. And, and, and we, we find ourselves attracted to this charismatic celebrity thing. It's why people long to be an influencer on social media because they can gain celebrity status. It's why uh, shows like Inside Edition and um, uh, Entertainment Tonight have been on for so long. It's why there's things called the paparazzi because we are infatuated with knowing how celebrities live and function in their daily basis. And what we do is we end up becoming, we become followers of these uh, different people. I believe that the Taylor Swift people are called Swifties, am I right? Okay, so I'm halfway into culture, okay? So uh, they're called Swifties. Um, there's, other, um, there's other people, that, that other groups that follow other things. And, and we begin to become a disciple of the celebrity in a sense. And you're probably sitting there saying, okay, pastor, how does that deal with the church? Well, what we have is we now have something that pops up in the church as well. We have a church culture that loves celebrity. They love the celebrity pastor. Well, they love the celebrity preacher. And we end up focusing more on the person than on God. And don't get me wrong, that the people that I'm about to list have great things. But we've ele sometimes elevated them to a status that, that, that is not what God necessarily intended. People like David Jeremiah, Stephen Furtick, John MacArthur, John Piper, Francis Chan, David Platt, Joel Osteen, Dave Ramsey... The list goes on and on. If they've written a good book, they've got followers that replace the local church with them. And they become the celebrity uh, to this person. And they will not listen to what is happening in their local church. They'll not participate in what's happening in their local church. They'll only focus on what those people are saying. And they'll say, well, I read his book and it says this, so this is truth. Or I read her book or her Bible study, and I got so much out of it, you've never taught me like that. Which is probably true. But we misplace our affection for where things should be. We have become a culture of celebrity pastors and Christian speakers with the ability to stream a service at any time. And because we can stream a service at any time, it's easy to begin to follow a certain personality and not follow the, where the church is headed. And we've run this risk that in that we cannot necessarily check them in the things that they are doing, the things that they are saying, their intent. Because do you really get to know that person? You don't. And so we have people, and I'll say it, like Joel Osteen, who has built a whole empire preaching false doctrine. And many, many, many people in this world think that what Joel says on a Sunday morning with a bright, flashy smile is the truth of Scripture, and it's not. 
And many people also think that this is just a phenomenon for today's church. And it's not. It's not a new phenomenon. It's something that Paul saw taking place in the church at Corinth. He saw that the, the, church, the local church, the local congregation at Corinth was beginning to put their focus on man and not on God. And it was such a big deal for Paul when he saw this that he felt it important. Enough. And here's the thing, because you're about to see in Scripture, Paul recognized that he was one of the celebrities. He was one of the ones that they were putting their faith in over Scripture. And that made him very uneasy, so much so that he decided that he needed to address it directly. And that's what he does here in 1 Corinthians 3. Because what was happening in the, let's look at the context of what was happening here, was that there were different leaders in the church. Paul had started the church. Apollos came in. There were different leaders in the church. And the, the people of the church had aligned themselves with individuals' teachings. Or they connected with them better. And they felt like, oh, this is, this is my leader. Uh, no, this is my leader. And it started to create a division. And they'd lost sight of the fact that Jesus is the, only, is the church's only figurehead. And they'd forgotten that the servants, the leaders that they were following, who they claimed allegiance to, they'd forgotten that they are merely human and merely Christ's servants. They'd elevated them to a deity status in the church. And because of this, they developed uh, attitudes, one side or the other, partisan attitudes that began to damage the health of the church. And when the health of the church is damaged, it began to damage the mission of the church. And it began to damage the message that the, the impactfulness of the message that they were taking out. And us in the modern church today, we fall into the same line of thinking oftentimes, the same thing that trapped the Corinthians. We find a leader or a teacher that we respect, that we like what they say, it resonates with us, it might be something that's going through, uh, that we're going through uh, in our life that they, that they speak about, and it just hits you. And you begin to develop loyalties to the loyalties to them, to their thinking, and to the way they do things. And let me tell you, pastors do this too. Pastors do this too. I have other church leaders and church pastors that I have listened to, that I've read every book they've read, and I've had to do my dead level best not to become a clone of them. Because I like what they do so much. But we discover these people that we respect, and we do this even when the, the, the leaders teach and the leaders do thing, things that are not biblical, and they're leading us astray. And you know, Scripture says in the last days there will be false teachers that arise, and I believe we are seeing a new resurgence of false teachers in our world today, that they're teaching about they're teaching motivational messages, self-help messages that are not scriptural, but they're leading you. They're just close enough to what to to the message to the scriptures. They're just close enough to something that God would say that you that people think, man, he's right. And the next thing you know, they're 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 far away from the truth because they've made something in their life an idol that the the scriptures took away from them. And and when these things start to happen, and when they start to come in and say, well, this person said this, or this person said this, or I, I'm learning about this from this person, and the egos and personalities in the church leadership begin to take over amongst the people, the church becomes damaged. Because Satan is in this world, right? Amen. And Satan has one goal. And that's to stop the momentum and destroy the message of Jesus Christ. And the way he does that, because he's in this world, is he uses the world to divide. He uses the world to divide. Look at 
uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you not, were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not merely being human? Paul says right off the bat, the world is dividing you. The world has gotten inside of you and, and began to influence you and to spread you apart. You're no longer unified. How do I know? Well, first off, because you're not mature enough to catch these things. And he's not saying this as a, as an, uh, a, a negative slight to them. He's speaking the truth. You are a young believer. You are such a young believer. You're an infant in Christ. You're an infant in Christ. You have to drink off of milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for it yet. And because of that, because you're still a spiritually immature group, these divisions seek in, seep in. Excuse me. Think about this. Think about churches that you've seen that are healthy and unhealthy. The churches that stay together and they handle, they can go through things that are very difficult and stay unified usually have a very, very strong core of solid, mature believers. The churches that don't, if you were to really dive deep into their discipleship and into their, the, the, the spiritual lives of the people, you would find that there was a lot of masks going on in that room. That they sounded spiritual, they sounded biblically mature, but they, there was no no guidance of the Holy Spirit in their life. Because division demonstrates spiritual immaturity. And that's what Paul's talking about when he talks about the infants in Christ. The other thing that division does is it causes believers to act like unbelievers. And if you ever want a picture of believers acting like unbelievers in today's world, go on Twitter and follow some people that are part of the church right now. I had to get off of Twitter this week because it is, and I love Twitter. I'm an information junkie, and I just love it. And I had to get off of it because it, I just was getting so disgusted and so, not even disgusted, I was getting so uh, just depressed over the way Christians were treating other Christians in public, on social media. Because it causes us to act like unbelievers, when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, you're acting just like the people that say, I follow Taylor Swift, and I follow Lionel Messi. You're just like the other believers. Because you're demonstrating your spiritual immaturity, and you're demonstrating the way that unbelievers act in the world. It's okay to be a fan of something. Don't get me wrong on that. But when we make them our leader, our source, our, the one that we pledge our allegiance to. In fact, we see this in our country today. Where politics has replaced the word of God. And we begin to follow and pledge allegiance to those who do not live the life that God wants us to live. Merely because they're the better option. And God says, tells us that you're not citizens of this earth, so why are you even following that? Follow my truth. And he then tells us, after he's talk, Paul talks about the word, world is dividing, he tells us how do we get to this point? How do we get to a point that we know what is truth and what is right and what is guiding us in a way? How do we build the church so that we're not divided? How do we be a part of something of that? And what starts as, or seems like a passage that is starting about talking about you as an individual and me as, a, as an individual person from an individual, individual mindset, we misinterpret this passage. 
Because this passage is not about the individual. This passage is about the church. And how does the church stay focused? And so Paul takes this and Paul then begins to talk about leadership in the church. And he's not talking about qualifications of a leader in the church. He's talking about how a leader should lead in the church. And the first thing he says is that the church needs proper leaders. Proper leaders. And I want you to hear me when I say that. Because proper is a different verb than some of the other places. Other, um, or adjective of, of leadership. We need proper leaders. He's not saying we need strong leaders. That helps, but strong leaders can take you the wrong way, right? He's not saying we need charismatic leaders. He's not saying we need business savvy leaders. He's saying you need proper leaders. What does he mean by that? Well, 1 Corinthians 3, 5, he tells us that we need proper leaders to nourish. Proper leaders to nourish the church to where it can grow healthily. Last week we talked about how the church was a living, breathing organism with a head and a body. Well, now Paul begins to use the illustration of a plant. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9, he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? What are they? They are servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. So God used Apollos and God used Paul to bring people to them, to him. He used them as messengers. Paul says, I planted, so I planted the church. I planted this local congregation. Just like somebody did in 1872 here in Mason. A group of 13 people began the process. They planted this local congregation. And then Apollos watered. And we've had many leaders over the years in, in the history of this church that have watered to see this church growing. I was, I was reading in a book the other day. Um, we, we found a book that is the 100th anniversary book of uh, First Baptist Mason. It was really cool to be looking through it and seeing pictures. And to realize that in the 40s, in the 1940s and early 1950s, there were almost 400 members in this church. And there was an average attendance of over 250 people in this church. So somebody was watering really well back then. They weren't under water restrictions like we are now and our grass is dying, right? They were watering really, really good. But then as we, as, as we move through, we've had some times in our church that the watering wasn't so great. And the church began to kind of dry up. But Apollos watered. Paul planted, Apollos watered, but they had nothing to do. Just like I can go out and I can look at my grass and say, grow, and guess what it's going to do? It's going to turn brown. Because it's not up to me for that, wa- that grass to grow. All I can do is try and take care of it. I can tend to it. I can put water on it. I can fertilize it. I can, I can give it nourishment. But the only way it grows is by God's design. God designed it to grow, and so it has to grow. And so you need proper nourishment. So it says, but God gave growth. So in verse 7, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's fields, God's building. And here he is again saying, it's a, the workers are going to be judged. The workers are going to receive wages according to the way they did. This is saying that the leaders of the church are set apart. Paul Washer said this, um, says this, that the, the people who should be most concerned with judgment day is not the atheists, it's not the agnostics, it's not the unbelievers. The people who should be most concerned on judgment day is the pastors. Why? Because they have been set, the, the atheists, the agnostics, the don't know any better. But the pastors have been set aside to shepherd the flock, to nourish them, to, to plant them, to water them, and to help cultivate the growth. But 
to give God the freedom to grow. The church needs watering. It needs a leader and leaders to nourish them. Just another word on that. Because I think oftentimes we mistake things when we're when we look for leadership in the church. Just because people have a good reputation in the community or a good standing in the community, or people think that they are great because they help people out, does not mean they are leadership material in the church. Where is their spiritual life? Because we've got people in all of our communities that are upstanding citizens that have never cracked open God's word a day in their life. They're just good people. But the church over and over again throughout its history has put good people in leadership with no spiritual life at all. And that's when Satan grabs hold of it. Because not only are the leaders supposed to be proper leaders who nourish, they're supposed to be proper leaders who build the church. Look in verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones... When the day comes, it will reveal, be revealed by fire. And the gold, silver, and precious stones are going to survive. They're going to withstand the, the, the turbulent time. They're going to withstand the fire, the heat, the damage that can come from it. Others are going to build on the foundation of wood, hay, and straw. They're not going to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. They're going to build on the foundation of cult and personality and charisma. And the people that build on wood, hay, and straw, cult, personality, and charisma, when the fire comes and tests it, it is going to be burned up. Verse 14 says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, take point of that. This passage does not say that that person is going to lose their salvation. Because we believe that scripture says that once you are saved, you are saved. You have eternal security. But what this is saying is that if you are a worker in the church, if you are a leader in the church... And you build the church on anything other than the foundation of Jesus Christ, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and the word of God, then you will lose your rewards on that day. And I think that goes for any believer. If you lead someone astray, there will be rewards lost when it comes to judgment day. The church needs a strong foundation. And that foundation is the message of Jesus Christ. The church needs people to build upon that foundation. And when you build upon a foundation, that means the church needs to be multiplying its leadership. It can't be one person. It can't be a handful. It's got to continually be growing Nurturing, that's what nourishment is. You're growing it, you're helping it grow. And as it grows, you're adding stones to the foundation. You're building something bigger and higher, stronger on that foundation. And when you build it with gold, silver, and precious stones, it will withstand the fire. It will survive the test of the enemy attacking it. Paul says you've got to have proper leaders to nourish and you have to have proper leaders to build because when he looks at the church, when God revealed to him the church and he looked at what was going on, he recognized the value of the church and saw that the church is worth more than a celebrity. 
the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the universal church, the local church is worth more than what that celebrity pastor or leader can bring to it. Why? Because it's God's church. Verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple? It's not talking about you individually. It is talking about the church is God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you, the church. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Paul says the church is worth more than a celebrity, so don't put your loyalty, don't put your allegiance, don't put every, all, of your, all of your chips into the basket of a person unless that person's name is Jesus Christ. The only play person that the church should be loyal to, the only person that the believer should be loyal to, Above all else is Jesus Christ. Our loyalty is to Christ. And if our loyalty is to Christ, then that means the gospel of Jesus Christ must be the focus. When a church quits preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the church loses its way. When the church takes that out of its focus, the church is lost. It can be found, it can be brought back, it can be revived. They call, the the buzzword of that right now is revitalization. To help it revive and become vital again. Our loyalty is to Christ, the gospel must be the focus. And if there's any division in the church, we must reconcile that division. And it's hard in the Western Western culture to do that. For a lot of times, the, the, the average pastorate for a long time was about 18 months. And they'd come and they'd, they'd come. And if you look at the history of our church, there's only been one or two pastors that has been here in 151 years that have been here longer than three years. Like I'm not saying I'm not saying the average length of our pastorates at First Baptist Mason have been three three years. That's the the length of our pastorships. Very rarely touch three years. And we're not any different than most churches in America today. And part of that is a pastor will be here. And the people are more loyal to the pastor prior to them than they are to Jesus Christ. Or maybe it was three pastors ago and they're still trying to find someone that fits the mold of that pastor three pastors ago. Some, pa- some people, a church that turns pastors over that quick, it might be ten pastors ago. And they just churn them out, churn them out, churn them out. Because their loyalty is not to Christ, their loyalty is to a personality. And it creates division in the church. And so by reconciling division in the church, what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to put our focus back on Jesus Christ. We're going to put our focus back on the gospel. Back on the message that says God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And it's important that we do this. It's important that we put our loyalty back on Christ, that we focus on the gospel, this foundation. And the question is, why should we do that? We briefly touched on it a second ago, but Paul says the church is God's temple. 
And that, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because in, in the Old Testament, the temple was where you went to worship, right? But only certain people in the temple, only the high priest could go into what was called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, that's where the high priest could go in and he could interact with God. But nobody else could. You were all left on the outside. But when Jesus came and when Jesus died and was a substitute for our punishment, and when he introduced the new covenant, and in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was released on the believers, the church or the place where God dwelt moved from the temple and it moved into the individual believer. And so the temple was no longer a structure It was no longer this beautiful sanctuary that we have. The temple was the life of each and every believer. And so last week when we talked about that Christ is the head of the church and the the believers are the body of the church, now we put that together. The body of the church is the temple of the church. And every individual believer makes up the greater church. The Holy Spirit indwells inside of you, and you can have a living relationship with him. Which is why Paul says, I I have no doubt, in the Jewish culture of the Old Testament, the people looked up to the high priest. They looked up to the high priest because the high priest was the only one that could interact with God in their culture, in their ritualism. But when the Holy Spirit Spirit indwells inside each and every believer, we don't have to look up to anybody else and pledge our allegiance to that person. In the Jewish culture with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, each, each Pharisee, each religious leader, each rabbi had their own disciples. They had these little cults of personality going around. People followed them because they connected with them. But in the new covenant, when the Holy Spirit is inside of you, the only thing, person, you should pledge your allegiance to is Jesus Christ. And when you pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ, you recognize that no longer are your preferences that important. God brings leadership into churches. God brings called leadership and God brings lay leadership into churches to help cultivate and grow and build upon what's already there. But it's up to each and every one of us as a part of the body of Christ, the living temple of God, to further the mission of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone we come in contact with. And we're doing our best here. We are by no means perfect, but we're trying. But we need more people to help us do that. We need people willing to say, help me become a leader. Help me grow. Help me move from the spiritual milk to solid food so that I can be prepared for when God wants me to be a leader in the church. Show me what it means. So you need to be a part of discipleship need to get into life connection groups and and we're going to be uh, launching some new stuff here in just a few weeks on that stuff you need to be part of a, a consistent bible study getting into god's word and knowing the foundation knowing the word of god you need to make it a priority you also need to serve and you might say well i don't know where to serve i don't know what to what i could even do and that's why we've got the shape assessment that we unveiled a few weeks ago. Some, a lot of you have taken it. It's awesome. Like, um, it's awesome. We've been looking at them, and, and uh, 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 we're in the process of, of nominating people for, for uh, committee roles for next week. And let me tell you how awesome it is to be able, for the next year, for us to be able to look at that and actually make informed decisions rather than saying, oh, they'll be good at it and have no clue. So if you haven't taken the shape assessment, 
check your, your email from the newsletters or the QR codes are back by, uh, at the, the coffee bar by David. Um, you can click on that. And I think, the, are there still some paper copies back there, David? There's some paper copies too. And we can get that in. It is great. It tells you so much about yourself. But we want to be a church that is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And it's going out into our community. Knowing that we are the living temple of God. And we need more and more people to be a part of that. More and more people. And it begins with that relationship that I just talked about with Jesus Christ. Um, you got to put your faith and hope in him. The Roman 10 9, you have to believe with your heart that Jesus died on the cross for you and confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. And I'd love to visit with you and talk to you about that this morning. Um, uh, if that's something that God's placing on your heart, I'd love to uh, help you join this church this morning. If you want to make this your family home, um, to be a part of a church that, that we're not going to listen to what the culture outside us is saying. We're going to look at what God is saying to us and how we should live our lives separate from the way of the rest of the world. Would you join me in a word of prayer?